the Lexus IS500 should not exist. It's got four doors, a naturally aspirated five liter V8, driving the rear wheels. What is Lexus thinking? In an era of turbocharging, hybridization, supercharging, electrification, Lexus debuts a V8 in a compact four-door sedan? Impossible, what are they thinking? But I know what you're thinking, you wanna hear the engine, so let's go for a drive, then we're gonna talk about this. Now there's a couple of things we need to talk about here. One is this engine. Woo. The five liter V8, 472 horsepower. It's pretty nice and not gonna lie. It is a really nice, smooth sounding engine. And of course, because it's naturally aspirated, there's no turbo lag, it just responds instantly to your throttle input, and that is really nice. Got one complaint, I wish it was a little bit louder. I don't think there's an induction pipe into the cabin like there is in the LC500. But man, this is a nice engine, and the one complaint I had about the IS350 F Sport was the fact the engine just wasn't that strong. So this definitely takes care of that. Remember the old Lexus? The one where everything was cushy and soft and compliant and all about isolation and keeping things luxurious. Well, throw that out the window because in 2009, Akio Toyota became the president, the CEO of Toyota, and he's got a whole new philosophy. You see, Akio Toyota is one of us. He's a petrol head. He's driven at Nürburgring. He competes in rally stages. And in 2012, Toyota introduced the FRS, or 8.6, or whatever you want to call it. Then he famously declared, no more boring cars, at the introduction of the new Camry. But, but that aside, in 2019, he brought us the brand new Toyota Supra. So things have changed at Toyota. This is not your grandfather's Toyota, or Lexus for that matter. Performance is back. Lexus lets you know this is a performance vehicle because the hood is about two inches higher. The center section is raised up to make space for that big, juicy, delicious sounding V8. So when Toyota starts making sports cars, you know some of that DNA is gonna trickle down in the Lexus. So here, we get an amazing five liter, naturally aspirated V8. It makes 472 horsepower at 7,100 RPM likes to rev, makes 395 pound-feet of torque. Now this same engine, and actually the transmission is also used in the RCF and the dearly departed GSF. Let's pour one out for the GSF. This car has one more thing in common with the RCF, and that is this eight-speed transmission. So they've plucked this engine and transmission from the RCF, put it into the IS500, but this does not make it an F car we're gonna talk about that in a minute. So this is an eight-speed automatic transmission. And this is the same transmission that is also used in the RCF. Full throttle. It does seem to shift pretty quickly in auto mode, but I'm not that a big a fan of it when you're in manual. So I put it in manual and the paddles are just a little bit, a little bit laggy, so if I hit Downshift, it's just a hair. I wish it was a little hair faster. It's a little bit, a little bit slow. But in automatic mode, it's pretty good. Now, I will say that the programming is definitely geared more towards fuel economy. So in anything but Sport S Plus, it almost seems like you're in a gear that is a little bit too low. So in the canyons, which you would think is the natural place for this vehicle, and to some degree it definitely is. It does seem to enjoy the canyons. It's ride quality of that engine. The ride quality is superb in here, even in the most stiff setting. Really, really has excellent ride quality. It's soaking up all these road imperfections. I've been on this road with a lot of different vehicles, and this is definitely giving me the smoothest ride of any vehicle I've been in. And this is a 
a luxury sports sedan. It's a four-door sedan. Ooh, the ride quality is superb in here. The adaptive dampers really do an excellent, excellent job. That is absolutely one of the high points of this car, the, the Lexus magic those suspension engineers do at Hogwarts, wherever they go to school. It's very, very, very good indeed. Turn-in is nice in this car. You always feel like there's a lot of confidence going into corners. The steering is giving you good feedback. Now, there is another downside in here though, and that is the, the traction control system. I've been driving with it on. I'll turn it completely off now if I can. All right, traction control off. Can I turn stability off? Apparently I need to be in park to do that. So here's the big complaint about the VSC, the stability control system. It is extremely intrusive. When you're coming out of a corner, trying to apply a little bit of power, it just absolutely kills the engine. It just like shuts it down. I wish there was a different setting. I wish there was like a D, uh, VSC uh, enhanced stability mode, but when it turns it off, you can definitely feel the dynamics of the car a little bit better. 14 inch brakes, pretty good. Pretty good, not gonna lie. Now these tires, not my favorite. These are not the grippiest tires in the world by any stretch of the imagination. This is not like a Pilot Sport Cup, anything like that. These are Bridgestones, and they definitely sort of limit what you can do with the car, but that's easily solved with the aftermarket. You can definitely go and get yourself some, some different tires in here, but these don't have a lot of grip, and the car does get to be a little bit pushy in the corners, but overall, the status of this car is very, very neutral turn it in. There's not a lot of understeer. You can definitely control the rear with your right foot to some degree. And oh, that, that engine is really, really nice. But that is one of the things that I wanted to talk about why this is not a full F car. This is not an RCF. So F being at the top of the spectrum. The suspension in that is firmer. It's more taut. There's more steering feel. There's better motion control. There's definitely a little bit less of bounciness over imperfect surfaces. Yeah, the ride isn't quite as good, but it has more of an edge to it. And this is what this, is what this doesn't have. And it's not a complaint, particularly. This is how the car is positioned. This is not really a competitor to an M3, for example. And this is priced a little bit less, quite frankly. An M3 starts at about $70,000. This is about $60,000 and we're not talking about dealer markup or anything like that. So this is not really a competitor to the M3 or for example the Audi S4. This is a different kind of beast. But man, the suspension work in here is so, so excellent. And the V8 sounds absolutely amazing. But this is playing in pretty pricey territory when you're getting up around $60,000. $70,000 for a car. If you're really looking for an ultimate hardcore performance car, this isn't quite, this isn't quite an F. Let's just put it out there. It's very, very good at what it does though. And it is very entertaining to drive. And it's a lot of fun in canyons like this. And so these are just, these are not even a complaint really. It's just again, it's how this car is positioned and who the buyer is gonna be. It's a very easy car to drive quickly. You can basically soak up a lot of miles fast with this car, and it really is very entertaining. Now, there's another interesting car that I wanted to bring up in comparison to this, which is almost exactly the same weight and almost exactly the same price and almost exactly the same power, and that is the Mustang Mach 1. So you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, these cars are not the same. How could these possibly be compared? But based on price, based on power to weight ratio, and based on, well, tire size is much bigger, sort of based on a performance car, even though they are similarly priced, the Mach 1 is a very different beast. The Mach 1 is sort of the equivalent of an F car. And I don't think there's gonna be a lot of cross shopping, but I did think it was worth bringing up because they're both very entertaining canyon cars to drive. 
clearly the interior in here is far, far better, and the refinement is far, far better than the Mustang, and so are the panel gaps and everything else about it. Here's where things tend to get a bit weird, though. Lexus driving signature is this philosophy about driver interaction, good feedback, good control that tell you what the car is doing. They're moving in a more performance direction, but they've now introduced four grades, four levels of Lexus F-Sport, and it's a bit confusing. The first level is F-Sport design. That's things like wheels, bumpers, and things like this blackout spindle grille. Then there's F-Sport handling, where the suspension is tuned a little bit more for handling and performance. So you've got things like stiffer springs, you might have some different anti-roll bars, and adaptive suspension, which this has. The IS500 is the vehicle that Lexus is using to introduce the F-Sport performance lineup. And you can tell from the rear, you've got these very nice quad tip exhausts, which are basically the crib from the RCF. Visually, there's not a lot of difference between this and the IS350. You got the power bulge on the hood, you got the quad tip exhaust, and the front fenders and the bumper are slightly longer to accommodate the V8. Other than that, it looks kind of the same, and I call this a sleeper. The interior is pretty much exactly the same as the base IS350. Not a lot of changes here. You do get new Lux, which is an imitation leather. It's very nice, but this interior has been around for a couple years. I did cover it in my IS350 F Sport video. If you want to go check that out, I've got a much more detailed review of the interior. This is black. And it's sort of a very German Teutonic style interior. I like a little bit of color, especially with this beautiful blue outside, but that's just my opinion. The IS500 is an amazing gentleman's V8 cruiser canyon car. It's got a lot of luxury. The ride is absolutely amazing, very much in line with the Lexus GSF. And I also just wanted to bring out another Toyota product to illustrate a much more hardcore offering that is going to be a lot more track friendly, is a lot more aggressive, and is a very different nature. So now that we know what the IS500 F Sport Performance is and who it's for, I've got one question for you. Do you think we should take the engine, the V8, from the F Sport Performance, the IS500, and put it in the Supra? Let me know in the comments. My name is Eric. Please subscribe if you like this video. Thanks for watching.